it's sad because we're going to be finishing up gentlemen this morning. After uh, 14 messages, uh, which I never really thought whenever we went into Jonah, I said, well, maybe the last a month uh, at the most. And uh, here we are, 14 messages later, uh, coming to a close, uh, I believe. I believe. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. I want you to know that uh, I never expected to uh, experience uh, the blessings I've received um, from, from studying this book as we've gone through it. I, I feel like I've grown as a man from having studied this book. And uh, I feel like Jonah a lot of times um, as well. Jonah chapter 4. We're going to begin reading with verse 5, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Jonah chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. A lady went to her pastor, and uh, she said, I hope you didn't take it uh, personally, Pastor. Uh, she said, whenever my husband uh, walked out during your sermon, and uh, the preacher said, well, I did find it a little bit uh, discouraging. And she said, well, it's not a reflection on you, uh, preacher. Uh, she said, Ralph's been uh, walking in his sleep ever since he was a child. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, briefly recap sort of where we are this morning. Jonah has finally made it into Nineveh to preach. And the people have repented from the king all the way down to the common folks. And we noticed last week that Jonah is angry. And he's praying that the Lord will take his life. And God had turned from the evil, the destruction that he said that he would do to Nineveh. And we examined the subject of anger in great detail last week. And we left off with God asking Jonah the question, Doest thou well to be angry? Or do you have a good reason to be angry? And today we'll do what's called expository preaching. Uh, we'll look at each one of the verses. Uh, like I said, last week was more of a subject uh, sermon. Uh, this week we'll look at it verse by verse, what we have left. And there's lots of meat here. And I tell you, it was hard for me to bring this to a close. I think we could have prepared a message for each one of these uh, verses. But... Uh, <laughs> But we'll, we'll move on and as we attempt to conclude this book. Jonah chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. So Jonah went out of the sea and sat on the east side of the sea. And there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the sea. And the Lord God prepared a door and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gold. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gold that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gore? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gore, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six four thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cat. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we have read a portion of your precious word. And Lord, now we will attempt to preach from it. Father, I pray that you'll help me to preach this message as if I knew this would be the last message that I would ever deliver this side of glory, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, Lord. And Father, I pray that each one under the sound of my voice this morning would give ear and attention as if they knew this would be the last message that they would ever hear this side of glory. And Father, not one of us knows but that what it might be. So Father, help us to have open ears and open hearts, Lord, 
and help us to apply what we hear to our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The people had repented. The men, the women, everyone had gotten right with God. The largest revival in the history of the world. There were some 600,000 as is uh, estimated 600,000 baby believers within those walls of Nineveh. A preacher's dream, I might say, to have everyone attend, everyone eager to learn, everyone receptive to the teaching of the Word of God. And Jonah, as a preacher, as a prophet, finds himself in the situation. But where is he? Is he teaching and discipling all of these new believers? Is he in the midst of them encouraging and ministering to them? Is he following up with all of these new converts? No. The Bible says that he has gone out to the east side of the city to pact. He has removed himself from people and he is now sitting on the sidelines. Do you want to know a guaranteed recipe for depression? A guaranteed recipe for depression is to do what Jonah did and to distance yourself from people. Want to know how to overcome depression? Do something good for someone else. Do something good for someone else. Do something good for someone else. And I'll say that again. Do something good for someone else. A study was done and on, uh, for, on depressed individuals. And the participants were asked to engage in helping someone by doing three good things or three good deeds for an individual. What were the results? Were well, 94% of these depressed individuals showed a decrease in their depression. So if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling low today, go do a good deed, a random act of kindness for someone. Take someone to get groceries they can't drive. Pick up flowers for your wife. Wash someone's car. Iron your husband's shirt. Write an encouraging letter to someone. The second part of verse 5, and again, like I said, we could spend a lot of time on each part of these. The second part of verse 5 says, till he might see what would become of the sea. Jonah seems to hope that the repentance of Nineveh was lacking. And he seems to be hoping that the city will be destroyed after all. Jonah may have doubted the sincerity of their conversion. I wonder this morning, have you ever doubted someone's salvation? Have you ever seen someone walk forward in a service like this and thought, oh, I know that guy. He's just doing all this for attention. Or have you ever seen someone get baptized in the back, go through the baptismal waters and you think, oh, I know her. Oh, I know all about her. People have told me about her. This will never last. Have you ever found yourself judging people like that? It's wrong. I'll say it again. It's wrong. So there Jonah sits out of the city in a shelter that he made, feeling sorry for himself. And now he's judging the city that God had just found worthy to be forgiven. Now let's move on to verse 6. What is God going to do with this angry, pouting prophet of his named Jonah? Will God send a lightning bolt down to strike him dead right where he is? In vengeance, will he destroy Jonah? No. Remember from last week's message that we serve a gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and kind God. So what does God do for Jonah? God looks down from heaven and he sees Jonah pouting because 600,000 people were saved. And God says, I think I'll bless him by bringing him shade from that hot Middle Eastern sun. So the Lord prepares a gourd, as we read, a vine, a plant to come over to cover Jonah's head. And that's God's grace, my friends. That's God's grace. You see, when we least deserve it, is when He is often best. And when you and I least deserve His blessings is when God is going to often lay it on thick for us. When the Lord God prepared this gourd, was Jonah doing with him? Was he doing what he was supposed to be doing? Was his attitude right? Was his heart soft and tender? No, it was not. This reminds us, this reminds you, and this reminds me this morning. 
that God's blessings are never on the basis of our deserving being. They are always based on His grace. On His grace. And grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of Almighty God. You know, you and I have the attitude that if we go and volunteer at the homeless shelter and help feed some folks, or if we go and cut our elderly neighbor's grass, or if I help a buddy with something that he needs done, then I've earned God's grace. And I deserve God's grace. No, it doesn't work that way. God says to Jonah, He says, I know you're mad, Jonah. I know that there are problems with your perspective. I know there are problems with your attitude, but I love you anyway. And Jonah, here's a blessing for you. A gourd, not because of anything you have done, but in spite of everything you've done. No, we don't deserve the least of his blessings any more than Jonah did. I have found that when I'm pouting, and when I have the wrong outlook on life, God sends me a gourd, a shade, to cool me down to deliver me from my grief. God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you like and He knows what you need this morning. He knows what kind of gourd to send and when to send it over your head. When you're feeling discouraged, when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling weak, God prepares a gourd for you, a vine, a plant. And you all know what I mean. He sends that person with an encouraging word when you need it most. He gives extra money for that unexpected bill that comes. He provides an open door to flee from that temptation that comes your way. He shines the spotlight on a particular scripture verse that you need in your greatest hour. He prepares a goal to deliver us from our grief. Just when we need it most, in our great hour of need, here comes that gourd growing over my head, growing over your head, that vine, that plant, prepared by God to comfort us. And praise God for those gourds in our lives. Praise God for those gourds in our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, what did Jonah think of this gourd? He was, the Bible says, he was exceeding glad of the gourd. When Jonah was delivered from that great fish, the Bible doesn't record him being happy. When 600 Ninevites were saved, the Bible doesn't record Jonah's being happy. But only when his personal comfort was met and the shade of that gourd was he happy. Was he finally happy. The first time and the only time Jonah is happy. Jonah's happiness was just as fleshly as his anger, if you recall, in last week's study. All about self. Self. I wonder about you this morning. Are you only concerned with yourself? What self got for Christmas? What self wants for dinner today? What self wants to do today? Where self wants to go on vacation during the summer? And some of, you know, some of that is okay if you live by yourself as long as God approves. But if you have a family, and if you have a spouse, then I want to tell you this morning, it's not all about self. It's not all about what you want to do, and when you want to do it. It's all about what God calls you to do, and what He wants you to do, and when He wants you to do it. Verses 7 and 8 now, as we move on. Jonah is finally happy, until here comes a worm slithering along, and began chewing on that old gourd. That old vine, that old plant. And as that gourd began to wither, Jonah began to complain. You know, you and I do the same thing. We think, why would God take away my gourd of job security? Or why would He have my boss, that worm, to come sliver in my direction and tell me my work is done with the company? Or why would He take away my gourd of emotional security? Now, before we complain too much, Let's not forget who prepared this worm. First of all, let's look real quick. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Who prepared the great fish to swallow Jonah? Do y'all see it? Anybody? Who prepared that great fish? The Lord. Now in chapter 4, verse 6, who prepared that gourd? The Lord God. And now in uh, verse 7 of chapter 4, who prepared the worm? God did. He did. Why the world? Would God prepare a worm to devour this gourd that's providing such a good, comfortable shade for Jonah? 
Because the Lord knows that we have a tendency to get too attached to the things of this world and the comforts of this life. God says, yesterday I comforted you, Jonah, with that gold, with that vine that grew over your head and provided you with shade. But today, Jonah, I'm developing you with the worm. I'm developing you with the worm. So one day, it's blessing and comfort with the Lord. And the next day, He deals with us and develops us with the worm. And you and I know that's basically the cycle of life. There are gourds and there are worms. And all of us experience those. Maybe you've had a worm to smite you recently. Maybe in the form of your husband or your boss or someone or something. Or first, first Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Job 1.21 says, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord used two simple things. A plant and a worm as object lessons in Jonah's life. Think about your life for just a moment. What objects in your life has God used lately to get your attention? And beyond that, what worm has irritated or bugged you in life? And you can fill in the blank. It bugs me when blank. What bugs you? Maybe a flat tire. Maybe when you spill something on your shirt, you're headed somewhere. Maybe when you leave the lights on in your car and the battery's dead. Maybe when the sermon goes past 12 o'clock, that irritates you. Maybe when you lock the keys in the car and you say, now that irritates me, that bugs me. But then what about those who die daily without Jesus Christ as their Savior? Jesus asks, does that bug you? Does that bug you? Jonah cared. And he loved that old gourd that... Uh, that he had all of one day. And he loved that gourd so much that once it withered, he himself wanted to die right along with it. And you say, well, how crazy is that? You know, in thinking of the gourd, most of us are blessed so much that we get too comfortable with our own gourds in life. Jonah had allowed that gourd to become an idol in his life. And God had to teach him a lesson. So, and you think about the gourds in your life for just a moment. It might be a football team that you get a little too emotional about. It might be your job. It might be your car. Whatever it might be that you just get all worked up about and you're just so attached to in this life. Someone has said this. How often our gourds are allowed to perish to teach us deep lessons. In spite of all we can do to keep them green, their leaves turn more and more dry and yellow until they droop. And uh, have you ever experienced withered joy in life? The gourd comes, you know what I'm talking about. The gourd comes and brings joy and happiness and comfort and pleasure and things are going so well and then <coughs> the worm comes and it's gone. Perhaps that gourd was prepared to teach you a lesson along with that worm that with your joy. So Jonah's joy is with him. The hot blazing sun is beating upon his head and he's angry and he wishes he was dead. Look at verse 9. You notice Jonah would have been happy had Nineveh been, been destroyed. But he was angry that that one little plane was destroyed. We see that God asked Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about the, about the gore, Jonah? And of course Jonah's like, yes I do. Yes, I do. I wonder, have you ever been angry, maybe with your spouse or with somebody? And, uh, and, and as a Christian, you know that Holy Spirit tugs at you, and, and you know that, that you, you know the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And you know you shouldn't be angry, and you can feel it in your spirit. God saying, do us that well to be angry, or do you have a good reason to be angry? And you reply just like Jonah. Yes, I do. You want to sit there and, and pet it and and, uh, and, and be that way uh, for a while. And, and that's not what God has called us to do. Jonah made three errors that put angry people in a worse place than where they were when they first began. And be careful because these three, 
these three things happen when we start counting in life. First, the gentleman quit. You think about it when you're on a, say you're on a baseball team and, and uh, your son's not getting the play in time that you think he should get or whatever. What's the first thing that you're going to do? Quit. Well, that's the first thing that, that we do when we get angry and start out. We want to quit. Secondly, we separate ourselves from others like Jonah. And then thirdly, we become a spectator and we just watch from the sidelines. And that's certainly not what God wants in Christian service. Jonah's last words are not good ones as we, we saw, but thankfully they are not the last words of the book. God was first to speak in Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 if you recall, and He'll be last to speak in verse 11 of chapter 4. And let me say that God always has the last word. He'll have the last word in your life, and He'll have the last word in my life. God always has the last word, and He has the last word in Jonah's life as well. Now as we move on to verses 10 and 11. God teaches Jonah a lesson on priorities. On priorities. He asked Jonah, Jonah, you had pity on this vine that you didn't plant and that lasted all of one day. Shouldn't I care about these Ninevites? Shouldn't I care about these Ninevites? At a uh, pastor's conference in Maryland, a speaker named Tony stood up and he said, quote, Yesterday, 30,000 children around the world starved to death, and you don't give a blank. And of course, he cooks. One of the preachers that were sitting there in that conference uh, thought to himself, Oh man, Tony, you shouldn't have said that. You've got these ministers hot and mad with you now. And then Tony continued, and he said, The sad thing is that you pastors are more upset that I said blank than you are that 30,000 children starved to death yesterday. And he was right. Many of us in this room have our priorities out of order. Jonah had his priorities all mixed up like those preachers that were sitting in that conference. More upset that the speaker had said a cuss word than they were that 30,000 children had died. You see, the plant was temporary, but people are eternal. The plant, the gourd, was of little value, but people are highly valued. Jonah played no part in making the plant grow, but God had every part in creating the Ninevites. Jonah sought his own comfort, and God sought Jonah's character. Jonah cared for the destiny of one plant, and God cared for the spiritual destiny of thousands and thousands of people in that city. The book of Jonah ends with a question from God to Jonah. The question for us, if we were to phrase it sort of in our day and time and apply it to our lives, the question or questions would be more like this. You answer them between you and the Lord. Do we agree with God that people without Christ are lost? Do we have compassion for the lost? Are we concerned that in our communities there is so much sin and so much, so little witness? Do we pray that the gospel will go to people in every part of the world? And are we doing our part in helping to send it there? Do we rejoice when sinners repent and trust the Savior? You know, and I've been in churches where this, where this would happen. Somebody will walk the aisle and they'll receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, uh, you know, we always say, uh, you know, come and, and uh, welcome the, the individual. Tell them how happy you are for them and how much you're rejoicing. And I've been in churches and half the crowd would walk out the door without ever even coming to speak to the individual. How sad is that? How sad. If you can't even come uh, welcome and tell someone and give them a hug and tell them how happy you are that they perceive Jesus Christ as their Savior, that their eternal soul has been snatched from hell and is now headed to heaven, what a sorry excuse you are as a Christian to not welcome them into the kingdom. Here is Jonah howling and mad because thousands have gotten saved and he's not even there for them. He's not even there. Do you rejoice when sinners repent and they trust Jesus as their Savior? If you don't, then there might be something terribly wrong with your own soul, my friend. All of these questions we have asked are, are and more are wrapped up into what God had asked Jonah. And we can't answer for Him, but we must answer for ourselves. Now in conclusion, yet again I know that we have uh, covered a lot uh, this morning. 
But I wonder, has God spoken to you today? Do you see some of yourself in Jonah as I do? Is it your lack of compassion for eternal souls? Is it your selfishness and wanting your own way every day? Is it your fits of anger and rage that you seem to portray all the time? Is it your isolation when you get mad and you just pull away from everybody and everything? Is it your constant judging and pointing your finger at others and what they do and what they shouldn't do and, and how they do it? Is it that you enjoy the, the joy of the gourd and the shade and the comforts and the pleasures of it, but boy, you hate it whenever God sends the worm? I wonder, is that you this morning? God is asking you just as much as He has done. Are you doing all you can to further the kingdom of God? You know, you and I are more like Jonah than we'd like to admit. Stubborn, happy, selfish, unconcerned for the lost. And we don't know Jonah's answer to God. We don't know what Jonah replied that day. The Bible doesn't tell us. Perhaps his response, and I hope your response and my response, will be like that of Job's in Job chapter 4, Job chapter 40. Verse 4, where he says, Behold, I am by. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. As we prepare for the invitation this morning, what is it that you need to do to be more in the will of God? That's really what this whole book has been about for Jonah. It's God has been the central character as we see it. And God's been preparing things to try to get Jonah turned around from the wrong direction to the right direction in serving Him. But I wonder this morning, have you been listening to these messages over and over and over again and you still haven't done it? You're still running the wrong way, doing the wrong things, going the wrong places, or have you finally turned around and are you serving the Lord? You come this morning in just a few moments when we when we have the invitation if you need to make a decision. Now, perhaps you're here and you, you enjoyed that that joy, that, that pleasure of life for many, many years, but suddenly a worm has appeared in your life. That worm has come and it's chewed away that gourd. That gourd, and that gourd could be good health. That gourd could be your finances. That gourd could be your job. That gourd could be the family at home. Perhaps things were going so well, and then here comes that worm slip, uh, slithering along and chews away at the back. And now there you sit, like Jonah, you feel like you're in a hot, blazing sun, and you just, you're just sitting there pouting. God doesn't want you to do that, folks. He wants you to come to Him. Remember, He prepared that vine to bring you pleasure and comfort. He also prepared that worm to develop you, to get you to be more like Him, to get you to be where you need to be in life. And you think about all of this and what we've talked about for these past few months of the jump. And if you need to make a decision in just a moment, you'd be prepared to do so. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word, Lord. Lord, there's just so much there, Lord, that uh, we feel like we barely scratched the surface so often. But Lord, I pray that despite my lack of preaching, Lord, that You still will touch somebody's heart here this morning. Lord, if there's someone here that's never trusted You as their personal Lord and Savior, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for that one. Lord, perhaps there's someone here that needs to, to make a decision, that needs to rededicate their life to You, Lord. They're your child. They followed you for a while in life, Lord, but uh, somewhere along the way, they've gotten away from you. And Lord, they need to come back to you. Help that one to come and rededicate their life. And Lord, perhaps there's someone here that, that uh, Lord, was enjoying life. Things were going good. Things were going well. And Lord, all of a sudden, here came that old worm. Here came that worm, seemingly to destroy their life. But Lord, we know that you sent the worm. And Lord, you know, we know that you sent the worm according to your word to develop us. Lord, to make us more like you. And Lord, that's really our goal. Our goal in this life and your goal for us is not how many years we're on this earth, but Lord, how close we get to you in the years that we have. And Lord, I pray 
that each one under the sound of my voice this morning will be determined, would be eager, and be committed, Lord, that when they walk out of here, that they're going to have a closer walk with Thee. And Lord, now bless this time of invitation, I pray. O Holy Spirit, come up and down these aisles and amongst these pews, convicting and wooing and drawing, helping anyone that needs to make a decision today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask you if you'll stand.